Right, okay, everyone, thank you. Hopefully you've had a short break um, and uh, a stretch. I just want to um, apologise again to you all, and uh, particularly to Andy. I'm so sorry about that. We did all of our checks and all of those things, and we've just had a tech glitch, so I'm very, very sorry. But um, hopefully we're going to... The, the slides are here now, so we're told, and we're going to start. So let's do this again. Let's welcome Andy back to the stage. Thank you. Yay! Yay! Thank you very much. That's great. Hey, thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, I ran through the agenda before, so I won't labour on that again now because uh, clearly that sunset is awaiting. Um, so the 5G vision. Well, let's just quickly recap on 5G. And the 5G vision is about delivering a lot of those aspects that were talked about in the early days. The early days of 5G really focused on enhanced mobile broadband. But from day one, we identified requirements for... Scale, scaling the Internet of Things through this massive machine-type connectivity. When we talk about the Internet of Things, traditionally, we think about things like water meters and various sensors, etc., that generate small amounts of non-real-time traffic. But, of course, the Internet of Things, the extreme version, is large things that generate lots of traffic and operate in real time. And that's all part of the capability that we can deliver with 5G. And then, of course, low latency and uh, high availability as well. All requirements that were identified early on, but are now coming to market as 5G evolves. So 5G Advance is the next big phase of 5G. It's like the second phase of 5G, really. It comes with what we call 3GPP Release 18, uh, and that's going to be ratified in 2024. So it's the next big standards drop, effectively, uh, of 5G capability. It's really focused on three key areas. Uh, it's focused on performance improvements, uh, better management and greater efficiency, including power efficiency, and enhancements for specific use cases. And this is actually where you, you're a really powerful audience because you can influence what happens in standards. And as we'll see as we go through, there are more and more industry verticals now developing their own kind of forums for the purposes of aggregating demand in terms of use cases and then presenting that into standards for uh, to get the support they need on capability as well. So if we look at 5G Advance in a little bit more detail, you can really break it down into two sets of benefits. I suppose what I'd say on this side here, you've got the kind of techie stuff that we use as network operators you know, that help us with uh, advanced downlink and uplink, massive MIMO antennas, etc., uh, enhanced mobility, you know, power efficiency, different types of repeaters, the integration of AI or machine learning into the way we develop and optimize our networks. But actually then on the right-hand side here, we've got a whole bunch of benefits from a user perspective as well. So extended reality, you know, the, the, the bounds are huge. Uh, some evolution in IoT, a thing that used to be called NR, New Radio Light, it's now called REDCap, you may have heard the term, Reduced Capability UE. It kind of fills the gap between a high-end enhanced mobile broadband modem and a small kind of narrowband IoT device that you know, would work with your, your water meter or something. So it gives a broader suite of capability, each pitched at the optimal price point and optimal performance level for a broader range of connected applications. Expanded positioning uh, and side link as well, both, both very useful. So side link gives you device-to-device -device communications as well, which can be useful in some scenarios, uh, driven heavily by the emergency services, for example and also kind of vehicle TWEX industry sectors. Uh, positioning, you know, again, having that detailed positioning and navigation, particularly for autonomous uh, devices. Multicast and drones and expanded satellite communications as well. And I'm going to talk a lot about that kind of non-terrestrial aspect and how that could integrate with that wider maritime and indeed supporting aviation sector as well. So I mentioned industry Verticals developing their own forums now. There's just two examples to pull out here. Digital Container Shipping Association, very relevant, of course, to the maritime sector, and also uh, the Digital Container Shipping Association, which shouldn't be on there twice. So there's a typo there. Uh, this first one, ACIA, this is correct. This is at Connected Industries and Automation. Uh, it's just uh, presented incorrectly on the actual slide, but the two URLs are correct. These are two different industry forums, effectively, that have got together now one around smart factories, one, one around uh, shipping containers, and they want to develop their own sets of requirements <coughs> to 
They want to prove there's sufficient market for those requirements to drive the development of standards and solutions to support them. So again, it just bringing that collective demand together allows you to influence standards and influence vendors and indeed bring solutions to market with the right kind of volume economics that you would like to see. Wi-Fi, I said I'll say a little bit about Wi-Fi as well. Wi-Fi is really, really important. Um, it's not a competitor with 5G. I often see articles on LinkedIn where you know, Wi-Fi people want to argue with 5G people and vice versa. Um, I'm a network architect, I'm a wireless network architect, and you know, my role is to make sure BT have the optimal range of technologies to address your requirements. If that's 5G, and in many cases in the applications we've talked about, it absolutely will be 5G, but in some cases it'll be Wi-Fi. If you've got an entire fleet of uh, laptops that are Wi-Fi enabled, you're not gonna swap them all for 5G laptops. You know, Wi-Fi will work in that application. But what we can do, and what's really, really interesting, is we can integrate Wi-Fi into a 5G network, including a private network. So there's a device called the non-3GPP interworking function. Now, it's definitely a techie on that one. Uh, that allows you basically to take a Wi-Fi service and connect it into a 5G core network to access all the services and capability. It could also take a Wi-Fi sensor or any other Wi-Fi device as well that may be existing as legacy and integrate it into that new system. So again, you know, Wi-Fi is a big part of the story. And there's lots of ways Wi-Fi can be deployed. Uh, we, we do this for a whole range of uh, customers, uh, including the MOD. Uh, we've got more spectrum available for Wi-Fi now, some more capacity with a new six gigahertz band as well. And whilst Wi-Fi is often connected to a, a fiber service, you can use 5G to extend the reach of Wi-Fi effectively through fixed wireless access or indeed like the MiFi type device we see at the bottom there. So Wi-Fi is a part of that portfolio as well. And then new space, I mentioned before, the definition of new space as an alternative to you know, traditional uh, institutionalized space. Uh, all I've included in this slide are up as far as low Earth orbit satellites. Clearly above that, we've got medium Earth and then geostationary satellites. But I was somewhat vertically challenged on the slide. So I thought, well, I'll focus on the new space aspects because that's uh, probably most interesting. LEO, low Earth orbit, so constellations like Starlink, like OneWeb. Uh, Starlink and OneWeb are very, very different. Uh, Starlink focus on a best effort internet access service, typically selling direct to customer, uh, whereas OneWeb focus on a kind of carrier grade quality of service model where they sell through telcos and traditionally do direct IP peering as well. So BT's got a 10 gig uh, interconnect in London with OneWeb. So again, we can offer end-to-end -end quality of service without touching the public internet. So security, latency, reliability. The evolution of inter-satellite links is an interesting development, particularly in the maritime sector, because today, if you can't see a satellite with either the user terminal or the ground gateway, you can't communicate. And that's a real issue when you get out into, into the seas and oceans. But actually, the introduction of inter-satellite links, which we're starting to see now in these constellations, means that actually you can relay between satellites. The capacity on this space segment is going to be significantly greater than the radio capacity to ground because, of course, at that height, we can use laser links. We don't have to worry about weather or any of those kind of issues, so we can carry huge amounts of capacity within that uh, sort of optical C-band. Additional developments in things like high altitude platforms, so you know, high altitude drones as well. Uh, the closer to ground, so you can get a much tighter beam pattern as well, so you can get more capacity and uh, more frequency reuse. UAVs, or drones generally, are a really interesting area. We, we heard about drones from the panel as well, the advantages they bring in, in some of the port operation scenarios. Of course, 5G can communicate to and from a drone, so it can control the drone. 5G could and indeed will be used to geofence drone highways in the future. And of course, a drone could be a 5G base station or relay in its own right as well to extend that coverage, potentially following a ship out to a particular location at sea. So lots of flexibility in terms of how we integrate these technologies. And the last one to touch on really <coughs> is this integration of earth to ground, or it always feels to me like it should be ground to earth, but earth to ground as we call it. There are two earth to ground networks operational over UK airspace now. One is a European aviation network for commercial airliners, and the second is the emergency services network, primarily aimed at communicating with helicopters. We will see more commercial 
earth-to-ground capability being launched as well, which includes the scenario I mentioned for things like uh, geofencing for drone highways, for example. And then you've got the rapid response at the end there, the ability to deploy capability quickly to deliver coverage wherever you need it, should there be any kind of uh, disaster or incident that drives the demand for additional capability. And you can see again that push now towards uh, support for aviation and you know, support for maritime as well as uh, kind of rural areas, remote areas, etc. So we're heading in the direction of complete global connectivity. And obviously the maritime sector uses the majority of that globe at one time or the other. So let's say a little bit about 3GPP non-terrestrial networks now. This is a really interesting development because this is about connecting 5G services to your smartphone or to your IoT device from satellite. So low Earth orbit satellites, uh, as we saw on the previous slide, but now con connecting to a commercial device. So you've not got a special Starlink dish or a one web satellite station or anything like that. You're connecting to your standard commercial device. Now these will never compete with terrestrial networks in terms of capacity, in terms of performance, in terms of cost. But what they will do is they'll augment those networks in such a way that if you're out of coverage, that you'll be able to connect. Now, initially, that's based around messaging services or low-speed IoT. The aspiration is to do voice and introduce some kind of uh, internet data service as well. It will be limited, very different to the terrestrial network, but nonetheless, you're going to have that truly global coverage from these constellations moving forward. An example of how we're dipping a toe in the water with this is the uh, <coughs> agreement between Apple and Global Star, whereas from iPhone 14 onwards, if you're out of coverage and it's supported in that particular territory, then you can send an emergency SMS, for example. So you can see the direction of travel there. And uh, as BT, we're working uh, with a number of partners across the ecosystem to make sure that we can bring the necessary solutions to market. So, quick whistle stop tour through some amazing technology innovation. You know, the key, key points to take away really is the fact that you know, 5G is evolving beyond mobile broadband, but also beyond the smartphone. You know, 5G is about so much more than smartphones. I'd even go as far as to say smartphones are just a hygiene factor. Of course we support them on 5G, and they're going to be faster, they're going to be lower latency, but actually 5G is about so much more. Industry verticals are forming their own technical associations to aggregate demand yeah, and actually drive support for their applications. So yeah, the entire 5G ecosystem is at your fingertips. You can influence it. 5G Advanced uh, brings enhanced support for extended reality, side link, positioning, IoT, drones, and non-terrestrial networks. So we truly are now starting to integrate you know, space-based networks airborne networks and terrestrial networks into one truly global heterogeneous capability. Wi-Fi continues to evolve and is a complementary solution. You know, you've got to map the service requirements to the technology, and that's exactly what we do in BT. We're, we're technology agnostic. We'll find the right solution for the right problem. Leo Mega Constellations are offering game-changing global connectivity. So massive new markets in aviation and maritime applications, yeah, these will augment terrestrial networks, so they're never going to replace terrestrial. Uh, but actually, they're a really, really powerful augmentation. 3GPP, non-terrestrial networks, will enable truly global 5G coverage for messaging, calls, and low-speed data, mainly focused on IoT. But collectively, you know, we just you know, really talk very quickly about a lot of technology here, a lot of developments. But collectively, these technical developments offer significant opportunities for maritime innovation. So we'll be delighted to talk more, and thank you very much.